Hi everybody, welcome back. Uh, we are doing another uh, reading video. We are still going through the Harry Potter series. Um, in case you guys don't remember or haven't watched my other video, we are on Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. We are doing the second chapter this time. Um, for all of you who've never read the Harry Potter series or have never seen the movies, the first chapter was talking about um, where we meet uh, the Dursleys, who are Harry Potter's aunt and uncle. Um, we meet Professor Dumbledore and Professor McGonagall and Hagrid. Um, Professor Dumbledore um, asked Hagrid to bring Harry Potter to his aunt and uncle's house. Um, even though his aunt and uncle are not um, okay with magic at all. So... We, I'm actually doing, I'm actually going to be reading the illustrated version, mostly because I can't find my regular version of the book, um, but I figured you guys would like to see the pictures too. So I'll go through the pictures from the first chapter so you guys can see it. It has a picture of, um, uh, Hagrid in it, um, yeah, I figured that you guys would be intrigued. Um, so here's the cover. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. It's got the picture of the Hogwarts Express. Um, it's got a toad on the front. Probably Trevor. And there's Harry with all of his books or his trunk and stuff. Okay. Oh, a bunch of pictures of Mr. and Mrs. Dursley and Dudley. Alright. Oh. There's Professor McGonagall as a cat. Meow. Um, owl! Oh, there's Hagrid. Hagrid on a flying motorbike. Motorcycle. Alright, we are on chapter 2 called The Vanishing Glass. Nearly ten years had passed since the Dursleys had woken up to find their nephew on the front step, but perfect drive had hardly changed at all. The sun rose on the same tidy front gardens and lit up the brass number four on the Dursleys' front door. It crept into their living room, which was almost exactly the same as it had been on the night when Mr. Dursley had seen that fateful news report about the owls. Only the photographs on the mantelpiece really showed how much time had passed. Ten years ago, there had been lots of pictures of what looked like a large pink beach ball wearing different colored bobble hats. But Dudley Jersey was no longer a baby and now the photographs showed a large blonde boy riding his first bicycle on a roundabout at the fair, playing a computer game with his father, being hugged and kissed by his mother. The room held no sign at all that another boy lived in the house, too. Yet yeah, Harry Potter was still there, asleep at the moment, but not for long. His Aunt Petunia would awake, and it was her shrill voice which made the first noise of the day. Up! Get up now! Harry woke with a start. His aunt rapped on the door again. Up! she screeched. Harry heard her walking towards the kitchen, and then the sound of the frying pan being put on the cooker. He rolled onto his back and tried to remember the dream he had been having. It had been a good one. There had been a flying motorbike in it. He had a funny feeling he'd had the same dream before. His aunt was back outside the door. Are you up yet? she demanded. Nearly, said Harry. 
Well, get a move on. I want you to look after the bacon, and don't you dare let it burn. I want everything perfect on Duddy's birthday. Harry groaned. What did he say? His aunt snapped through the door. Nothing, nothing. Dudley's birthday. How could he have possibly have forgotten? Harry got slowly out of bed and started looking for socks. He found a pair under his bed and after pulling a spider off of one of them, put them on. Harry was used to spiders because the cupboard under the stairs was full of them and that was where he slept. When he was dressed, he went down the hall into the kitchen. The table was almost hidden beneath all of Dudley's birthday presents. It looked as though Dudley had gotten the new computer he wanted, not to mention the second television and the racing bike. Exactly why Dudley wanted a racing bike was a mystery to Harry, as Dudley was very fat and hated exercise. Unless, of course, it it involved punching somebody. Dudley's favorite punch bag was Harry, but he could kind of often catch him. Harry didn't look it, but he was very fast. Ouch. Perhaps, hold on. Perhaps it had something to do with living in a dark cupboard, but Harry had always been skinny and small for his age. He looked even smaller and skinnier than he really was because all he had to wear were old clothes of Dudley, and Dudley was about four times bigger than he was. Harry had a thin face, knobbly knees, black hair, and bright green eyes. He wore round glasses held together with a lot of cello tape because of, the, because of all the times Dudley had punched him on the nose. The only thing Harry liked about his own appearance was a very thin scar on his forehead which was shaped like a bolt of lightning. He had had it as long as he could remember and the first question he could ever rem- remember asking his Aunt Petunia was how he got it. In the car crash when her parents died, she said. She had said, and don't ask questions. Don't ask questions. That was the very first rule for a quiet life with the Dursleys. Uncle Vernon entered the kitchen as Harry was turning over the bacon. Comb your hair, he barked by way of a morning greeting. About once a week, Uncle Vernon looked over the top of his newspaper and shouted that Harry needed a haircut. Harry must have had more haircuts than the rest of the boys in his class put together, but it, but it had made no difference. His hair simply grew that way, all over the place. Okay, there's a picture of Harry in his cupboard. Ew. With a giant spider. Ugh, I hate spiders. Harry was frying eggs by the time Dudley arrived in the kitchen with his mother. Dudley looked a lot like Uncle Vernon. He had a large pink face, not much neck, small watery blue eyes, and thick blonde hair that lay smoothly on his thick fat head. Aunt Petunia, Aunt Petunia often said that Dudley looked like a baby angel. Harry often said that Dudley looked like a pig in a wig. Harry put the plates of egg and bacon on the table, which was difficult as there wasn't much room. Dudley, meanwhile, was counting his presents. His face fell. Thirty-six, he said, looking up at his mother and father. That's two less than last year. Darling, you haven't counted Auntie Marge's presents, see? It's here under this big one from Mummy and Daddy. All right, 37 then, said Dudley, going right in the face. Harry, who could see a huge Dudley tantrum coming on, began wolfing down his bacon as fast as possible in case Dudley turned the table over. Aunt Petunia obviously sensed danger too because she said quickly, and we'll buy you, buy you another two presents while we're out today. How's that, Pop- Popkin? Two more presents? Is that all right? Dudley thought for a moment. It looked like hard work. Finally, he said slowly, So have thirty, thirty, thirty-nine sweetums, said Aunt Petunia. Oh, said Dudley as he, as he sat down heavily and grabbed the nearest parcel. All right, then. 
Uncle Vernon chuckled. Little Tyke wants his money's worth, just like his father. Attaboy, Dudley. He ruffled Dudley's hair. At that moment, the telephone rang and Aunt Petunia went to answer it while Harry and Uncle Vernon watched Dudley unwrap the racing bike, a Cine camera, a remote control aeroplane, 16 new computer games, and a video recorder. He was ripping the paper off a gold gold wristwatch when Aunt Petunia came back from the telephone, looking both angry and worried. Bad news, Vernon, she said. Mrs. Figs broke her leg. She can't take him. She jerked her head in Harry's direction. Dudley's mouth fell open in horror, but Harry's heart gave a leap. Every year on Dudley's birthday, his parents took him and a friend out for the day to adventure parks, hamburger bars, or the cinema. Every year, Harry was left behind with Mrs. Fig, a mad old lady who lived two streets away. Harry hated it there. The whole house smelled of cabbage, and Mrs. Fig made him look at photographs of all the cats she's ever owned. Now what? said Aunt Petunia, looking furiously at Harry as though he'd planned this. Harry knew he ought to feel sorry that Mrs. Fig had broken her leg, but it wasn't easy when he reminded himself it would be a whole year before he had to look at Tibbles, Snowy, Mr. Paws, or Tufty again. We could phone Marge, Uncle Vernon suggested. Don't be silly, Vernon. She hates the boy. The Dursleys often spoke about Harry like this, as though he wasn't there, or rather, as though he was something very nasty that couldn't understand them, like a slug. What about what's-her-name, your friend, Yvonne, on holidays, snapped, snapped Aunt Petunia. You could just leave me here, Harry put in hopefully. He'd be able to watch what he wanted on television for a change, and maybe even have it go on Dudley's computer. Aunt Petunia looked as though she'd just swallowed a lemon. And come back and find the house in ruins, she snarled. I won't blow up the house, said Harry, but they weren't listening. I suppose we could take him to the zoo, said Aunt Petunia slowly, and leave him in the car. That car is new. He's not sitting in it alone. Dudley began to cry loudly. In fact, he wasn't really crying. It had been years since he really cried. But he knew that if he screwed up his face and wailed, his mother would give him anything he wanted. Dinky Duddy Duns, don't cry. Mummy won't let him spoil your, spoil your special day, she cried, flinging her arms around him. I don't want him to, to, to come, Dudley yelled between the huge pretend sobs. He always spoils everything. He shot Harry with a nasty grin through the gap in his mother's arms. Just then the doorbell rang. Oh, good Lord, they're here said Aunt Petunia frantically. And a moment later, Dudley's best friend, Pierce Polkis, walked in with his mother. Pierce was a scrawny boy with a face like a rat. He was usually the one who held people's arms behind their backs while Dudley hit them. Dudley stopped pretending to cry at once. Half an hour later, Harry, who couldn't believe his luck, was sitting in the back of the Dursley's car with Pierce and Dudley on the way to the zoo for the first time in his life. His aunt and uncle hadn't been able to think of anything else to do with him, but before they'd left, Uncle Vernon had taken Harry aside. I'm warning you, he said, putting his large purple face right up close to Harry's. I'm warning you now, boy. Any funny business, anything at all, and you'll be in that cupboard from now until Christmas. I'm not going to do anything, said Harry, honestly. But Uncle Vernon didn't believe him. No one ever did. The problem was, strange things often happened around Harry, and it was just no good telling the Dursleys he hadn't made them happen. Once, Aunt Petunia, tired of Harry coming back from the barbers looking as though he hadn't been at all, had taken a pair of kitchen scissors and cut his hair so short he was almost bald except for his fringe, which she left to hide that horrible scar. Dudley had laughed himself silly at Harry, who spent this, a sleepless night 
imagining school the next day where he was already laughed at for his baggy clothes and cello taped glasses. Next morning, however, he had got up to find his hair exactly as it had been before Aunt Petunia had cheered it off. He had been given a week in his cupboard for this, even though he had tried to explain he couldn't explain how it had grown back so quickly. Another time, Aunt Petunia had been trying to force him into a revolting old jumper of Dudley's, brown with orange baubles. The harder she tried to pull it over his head, the smaller it seemed to become, until finally it might have fit a glove puppet, but certainly wouldn't fit Harry. Aunt Petunia had decided it must have shrunk in the wash, and to his great relief, he wasn't punished for it. On the other hand, he'd gotten into tr terrible trouble for being found on the roof of the school kitchens. Dudley's gang... Sorry, Vegas is playing Dallas. Um, also one of my teams... Um, as most of you know, Anaheim's my team too. They won tonight against, uh, New Jersey, 6-5, to five, I believe. Um, boop, boop, boop. Dudley's gang had been chasing him as usual when, as much to Harry's surprise as anyone else's, there he was sitting on the chimney. The Dursleys had received a very angry letter from Harry's headmistress, telling them Harry had been climbing the school buildings. But all he'd tried to do, as he shouted at Uncle Vernon through the locked door of his cupboard, was jump behind the big bins outside the kitchen doors. Harry supposed that the wind must have caught him in mid-jump. But today, nothing was going to go wrong. It was even worth being with Dudley and Pierce to be spending the day somewhere that wasn't school, his cupboard, or Mrs. Fig's cabbage-smelling living room. While he drove, Uncle Vernon complained to Aunt Petunia. He liked to complain about things. People at work, Harry, the council, Harry, the bank, and Harry were just a few of his favorite subjects. This morning, it was motorbikes. Roaring along like maniacs, the young hoodlums, he said as a motorbike overtook them. I had a dream about a motorbike, said Harry, remembering sun suddenly. It was flying. Uncle Vernon nearly crashed into the car in front. He turned right around in his seat and yelled at Harry, his face like a gigantic beetroot with a mustache. Motorbikes don't fly! Dudley and Pierce sniggered. I know they don't, said Harry. It was only a dream. But he wished he hadn't said anything. If there was one thing the Dursleys hated even more than his asking questions, it was his talking about anything acting in a way it shouldn't. No matter if it was in a dream or even a cartoon, they seemed to think he might get dangerous ideas. It was a very sunny Saturday and the zoo was crowded with families. The Dursleys bought Dudley and Pierce large chocolate ice creams at the entrance, and then, because the smiling lady in the van had asked Harry what he wanted before they could hurry him away, they bought <coughs> excuse me. Um, they bought him a cheap lemon ice lolly. It wasn't bad either, Harry thought, looking at it as they watched a gorilla scratching its head and looking remarkably like Dudley, except it wasn't blonde. Harry Excuse me. Harry had the best morning he'd had in a long time. He was careful to walk a little little way apart from the Dursleys so that Dudley and Pierce, who were starting to get bored with the animals by lunchtime, wouldn't fall back on their favorite hobby of hitting him. They ate in the zoo restaurant and when Dudley had a tantrum because his knickerbocker glory wasn't big enough, Uncle Vernon bought him another one, and Harry was allowed to finish the first. I'm not sure what a Knickerbocker glory is. I think it's an ice cream cone, like what this picture shows. But I'm not sure. Harry felt afterwards that he should have known it was all too good to last. After lunch, they went into the reptile house. It was cool and dark in there, with lit windows all along the walls. Behind the glass, all sorts of lizards and snakes were crawling and slithering over bits of wood and stone. 
Dudley and Pierce wanted to see huge poisonous cobras and thick man-crushing pythons. Dudley quickly found the largest snake in the place. It could have been it could have wrapped its body twice around Uncle Vernon's car and crushed it into a dustbin, but at the moment it didn't look in the mood. In fact, it was fast asleep. Dudley stood with his nose pressed against the glass, staring at the glistening brown coils. Make it move, he whined at his father. Father. Uncle Vernon tapped at the glass, but the snake didn't budge. Do it again, Dudley ordered. Uncle Vernon wrapped the glass smartly with his knuckles, but the snake just snoozed on. This is boring, Dudley moaned. He shuffled away. Harry moved in front of the tank and looked in- intently at the snake. He wouldn't have been surprised if it had died of boredom. No company except stupid people drumming their fingers on the glass, trying to disturb it all day long. It was worse than having a cupboard as a bedroom, where the only visitor was Aunt Petunia hammering on the door to wake you up. At least he got to visit the rest of the house. There's Harry looking into the snake's um, window. The snake suddenly opened its beady eyes. Slowly, very slowly, it raised its head until its eyes were on a level with Harry's. Then it winked. Harry stared. Then he looked quickly around to see if anyone was watching. They weren't. He looked back at the snake and winked too. The head jerk the snake jerked its head towards Uncle Vernon and Dudley, then raised its eyes to the ceiling. It gave Harry a look that said quite plainly, I get that all the time. I know, Harry murmured through the glass, but he wasn't sure the snake could hear him. It must be really annoying. The snake shook, nodded vigorously. Where do you come from anyway? Harry asked. The snake jabbed its tail at a little sign next to the glass. Harry peered at it. Boa Constrictor, Brazil. Was it nice there? The boa constrictor jabbed its tail at the sign again and Harry read on. This specimen was born in the zoo. Oh, I see. So you've never been to Brazil? The snake shook its head. A deafening shout behind Harry made both of them jump. Dudley, Mr. Dursley, come and look at the the snake. You won't believe what it's doing. Dudley came waddling towards them as fast as he could. Out of the way, you, he said, punching Harry in the ribs. Caught by surprise, Harry fell to the concrete floor. What came next happened so fast, no one saw how it happened. One second, Pierce and Dudley were leaning right up close to the glass. The next, they had to, they had leapt back with a howl of horror. Harry sat up and gasped. The glass front of the boa constrictor's tank had vanished. The great snake was uncoiling itself rapidly, slithering out onto the floor. People throughout the reptile house screamed and started running for the exit. As the snake slid swiftly past him, Harry could have sworn a low hissing voice said, Brazil, here I come. Thanks, amigo. The keeper of the reptile house was in shock. But the glass, he kept saying, where did the glass go? The zoo director himself made Aunt Petunia a cup of strong sweet tea while he apologized over and over again. Pierce and Dudley could only gibber. As far as Harry had seen, the snake hadn't done anything except snip playfully at their heels as it passed. But by the time they were all back in Uncle Vernon's car, Dudley was telling them how it had nearly bitten off his leg, while Pierce was swearing it had tried to squeeze him to death. But worst of all, for Harry at least, was Pierce calming down enough to say, Harry was talking to it, weren't you, Harry? That was... Jordan, by the way, he came to bring me my lemonade. He's so sweet. Mm. Okay. Mm. Snakes. I love snakes. Someday I will have a whole room full of snakes and lizards and frogs and other reptiles. 
Uncle Vernon waited until Pierce was safely out of the house before starting on Harry. He was so angry he could hardly speak. He managed to say, go, cupboard, stay, no meals, before he collapsed into a chair and Aunt Petunia had to run and get him a large brandy. Harry lay in his dark cupboard much later. Harry lay in his dark cupboard much later, wishing he had a watch. He didn't know what time it was, and he couldn't be sure the Dursleys were asleep yet. Until they were, he couldn't risk sneaking into the kitchen for some food. He lived with the Dursleys almost ten years, ten miserable years, as long as he could remember ever since he had been a baby and his parents had died in that car crash. He couldn't remember being in the car when his parents had died. Sometimes, when he strained his memory during long hours in the, his cupboard, he came up with a strange vision, a blinding flash of green light and a burning pain on his forehead. This, he supposed, was a crash that he couldn't imagine where all the green light came from. He couldn't remember his parents at all. His aunt and uncle never spoke about them, and of course, he was forbidden to ask questions. There was no photographs of them in the house. When he had been younger, Harry had dreamed and dreamed of some unknown relation coming to take him away, but it had never happened. The Darcy's were his only family. Yet sometimes he thought, or maybe hoped, that strangers in the street seemed to know him. Very strange strangers they were, too. A tiny man with a violet top hat had bowed to him once while out shopping with Aunt Petunia and Dudley. After asking Harry furiously if he knew the man, Aunt Petunia had rushed them out of the shop without buying anything. A wild-looking old woman dressed in all green had waved mer merrily at him once on a bus. A bald man in a very long purple coat had actually shaken his hand in the street the other day and then walked away without a word. The weirdest thing about all these people was the way they seemed to vanish the second Harry tried to get a closer look. At school, Harry had no one. Everyone knew that Dudley's gang hated that odd Harry Potter in his baggy old clothes and broken glasses, and nobody liked to disagree with Dudley's gang. Chapter 3 Yeah, I'll read one more chapter. The Escape... Oh, wait, no. Uh, chapter 3, The Letters from No One The escape of the Brazilian boa constrictor earned Harry his longest ever punishment. By the time he was allowed out of his cupboard again, the summer holidays had started and Dudley had already broken his new, uh, his new camera, crashed his re remote control airplane, and burst him on his racing bike, knocked down old Mrs. Fig as she crossed Crooked Drive on his, her crutches. Harry was glad school was over, but there was no escaping Dudley's gang, who visited the house every single day. <laughs> Pierce, Dennis, Malcolm, and Gordon were all big and stupid, but as Dudley was the biggest and stupidest of the lot, he was the leader. The rest of them were all quite happy to join in Dudley's favorite sport, Harry hunting. This was why Harry spent as much time as possible out of the house, wandering around and thinking about the end of the holidays where he could see a tiny ray of hope. When September came, he would be going off to secondary school, and for the first time in his life, he wouldn't be with Dudley. Dudley had a place at Uncle Vernon's old school, Smell Things. Pierce Polkiss was going there, too. Harry, on the other hand, was going to Stonewall High, the local comprehensive. Dudley thought this was very funny. They stuffed people's heads down the toilet first day at Stonewall, he told Harry. Want to come upstairs and practice? No, thanks, said Harry. The poor toilets never had anything as horrible as your head down it. It might be sick. Then he ran before Dudley could work out what he'd said. One day in June, Aunt Petunia took Dudley to London to buy his smeltings uniform, leaving Harry at Mrs. Figg's. Mrs. Figg wasn't as bad as usual. It turned out she'd broken her leg tripping over one of her cats, 
and she didn't seem quite as fond of them as before. She let, she let Harry watch television and gave him a bit of chocolate cake that tasted as though she'd had it for several years. That evening, Dudley paraded around the living room for the family in his brand new uniform. Smelting boys wore maroon tailcoats, orange knickerbockers, and flat straw hats called boaters. What are knickerbockers? Maybe those are like a kind of... Whoops. <laughs> Jordan just spilled soda all over the floor. I actually put it all over the box for the games for you. I know. Hold on, I'm looking at it. Continue to read if you want, but I'll, um, I'll interject in a moment here. and figure out what the hell a knickerbocker is. See, here's Jordan. Say hi. Uh, we have no night nurse today. That's why we are both up while Gideon is, is asleep. Is that just a video? No, it's just a video. Uh, where was I? Oh, um, doop, doop, doop. Oh, they also carried knobbly sticks used for hitting each other while the teachers weren't looking. This was supposed to be good training for later life. Don't know how that makes sense, <laughs> but whatever. <laughs> what? They're knickers. Then like a new, at, or a New Yorker <laughs> or a New Yorker, what? <laughs> As an adjective. Well, I know knickers means underwears, but our underwear. As an like, adjective, knickerbocker refers to people or objects from Manhattan, but that's from that's before eighteen ninety eight. Um. People, places, historical events, art media. A bit of a history oh, lesson. Apparently, for you. that's why the Knicks are called the Knicks because they're actually the New York Knickerbockers. Oh, Knickerbockers true. clothing. Okay. Knickerbockers or knickers are a form of men's or boys' baggy knee trousers, particularly okay. popular in the early 20th century United States. Golfers, plus twos, and plus fours are, are breeches of this type. Breeches of breeches. Right. For World War II, skiers often wore knickerbockers too, usually ankle length. Till after World War One, in many English-speaking countries, including Britain, boys customarily wore short pants in summer and knickerbockers, knickers or knee pants, in winter. So it's like in the summer they wear the little like, shorts, yeah, like schoolboy shorts. They had longer pants that they wore. Yeah, in their That's what I thought. I just didn't know for sure. Knickerbockers. That's such a weird word. See, for example, the classic song "Blues in the Night" by Johnny Mercer. My mammy done told me I when I was in knee pants. My mammy done told me son. Okay. Okay. In Britain, they're always called knickerbockers. Knickers are women's underwear. Right. The fashion was imported from the U.S. from the 1860s to the 20s when it was dispersed by above-knee-length short trousers or shorts, probably due to the popularity of the scouting movement, whose uniform included shorts. Hmm. Towards the end of this period, knickerbockers may have been more of a fancy dress item for formal occasions, which would make sense in this context, yep. rather than everyday wear. At about 13 years, boys exchanged their knickerbockers for long trousers, Again, in British English, English, never pants as above. Today, knickerbockers are sometimes worn for walking or golf. So think golf what? pants. Weird. Okay. I would suggest um, just thinking golf pants. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's such a weird bird. As he looked at Dudley in his new knickerbockers, Uncle Vernon said gruffly that it was the proudest moment of his life. Aunt Petunia burst into tears and said she couldn't believe it was her ickle duddykins. He looked so handsome and grown up. Harry didn't trust himself to speak. He thought two of his ribs might already have been cracked from trying not to laugh. There was a horrible smell in the kitchen next morning when Harry went in for breakfast. It seemed to be coming from a large metal tub in the sink. He went to have a look. The tub was full of what looked like dirty rags swimming in gray water. What's this? he asked. Aunt Petunia. Or asked Aunt Petunia. Her lips tightened as sh they always did if he dared to ask a question. Your new, your new school uniform, she said. Harry looked at the bowl again. Oh, he said. Didn't realize they had to be so wet. Don't be stupid, snapped Aunt Petunia. I'm dying some of Dudley's old things, gray for you. It'll look just like everyone else's when I'm finished. Harry seriously doubted this, but thought it best not to argue. 
He sat down at the table and tried not to think about how he was going to look on his first day of Stonewall High. Like he was wearing bits of old elephant skin, probably. Dudley and Uncle Vernon came in, in both with wrinkled noses because of the smell from Harry's new uniform. Uncle Vernon opened his newspaper as usual and Dudley banged his smelting stick, which he carried everywhere on the table. They heard the click of the letterbox and the flop of letters on the, on the doormat. Get the post, Dudley, said Uncle Vernon from behind his paper. Make Harry get it. Get the post, Harry. Make Dudley get it. Poke him with your smelting stick, Dudley. Harry dodged, dodged the smelting stick and went to get the post. Three things lay on the doormat. A postcard from Uncle Vernon's sister Marge, who's holidaying on the Isles of Wight. A brown envelope that looked like a bill, and a letter to Harry. Harry picked it up and stared at it, his heart twanging like a giant elastic band. No one ever in his whole life had written to him. Who would? He had no friends, no other relatives. He didn't belong to the library, so he never even got rude notes asking for books back. Yet here was a letter addressed so plainly there could be no mistake. Mr. H. Potter, the cupboard under the stairs, four privet drive, little winging, Surrey. Winging. Winging. It's called little winging. Okay. Just, just so you know. Okay. The envelope was thick and heavy, made of yellowish parchment, and the address was written in, a, in emerald green ink. There was no stamp. Turning the envelope over, his hand trembling, Harry saw a purple wax seal bearing a coat of arms, a lion, an eagle, a badger, and a snake surrounding a large letter H. Hurry up, boy, shouted Uncle Vernon from the kitchen. What are you doing checking for letter bombs? He chuckled at his own joke. What I don't understand is he's literally passing his cupboard why not just drop the letter off in his cupboard before going to the kitchen with the other the other pieces of mail? Because Harry's not a Ravenclaw. He but that's common Ravenclaw, sense. He would have stuck it in his pocket when he was at the front door where nobody could see him, and then he would have read it later. Yeah. That's why anyway. Because if anyway. I was in that situation, I'd have been like, okay, this is mine. Stick it in my shirt. Right. Because I wouldn't Harry, have thought, there's no way they would let me have this. Harry went it's back to the kitchen, still staring at his letter. He handed Uncle Vernon the bill in the postcard and sat down and slowly began to open the yellow envelope. That's another problem. He went slowly. I would have just ripped it open. Uncle Vernon ripped open the bill, snorted in disgust, and flipped over the postcard. Marge is ill, he informed Aunt Petunia, ate a funny whelk. Dad, said Dudley suddenly. Dad, Harry's got something. Harry was on the point of unfolding his letter, which was written on the same heavy parchment as the envelope, when it was jerked, set, jerked sharply out of his hand by Uncle Vernon. That's mine, said Harry, trying to snatch it back. Who'd be writing, writing to you, sneered Uncle Vernon, shaking the letter open with one hand and glancing at it. His face went from red to green faster than a set of traffic lights. It didn't stop there. Within seconds, it was grayish white of old porridge. P Petunia, he gasped. Dudley tried to grab the letter to read it, but Uncle Vernon held it high out of his reach. Aunt Petunia took it curiously and read the first line. For a moment, it looked as though she might faint. She clutched her throat and made a choking noise. Vernon! Oh my goodness, Vernon! They stared at each other, seeming to have forgotten that Harry and Dudley were still in the room. Dudley wasn't used to being ignored. He gave his father a sharp tap on the head with his smelting stick. I want to read that letter, he said loudly. I want to read it, said Harry furiously, as it's mine. Vegas one, four to two, wow. Get out, both of you! 
croaked Uncle Vernon stuffing. So. He'd be cheering like that for Pittsburgh if he was still playing. Mm, maybe. Your boy got a, did get a point the other night. True. He scored his first goal. Um. Uh, get out, both of you! Croaked Uncle Vernon, stuffing the letter back inside its envelope. Harry didn't move. I want my letter! He shouted. Let me see it! Demanded Dudley. Out! roared Uncle Vernon, and he took both Harry and Dudley by the scruffs of their necks and threw them into the hall, slamming the kitchen door behind them. Harry and Dudley promptly had a furious but silent fight over who would listen at the keyhole. Dudley won, so Harry, his glasses dangling from one ear, lay flat on his stomach to listen at the crack between door and floor. Vernon, Uncle Petunia was saying in a quivering voice, Look at the address. How could they possibly know where he sleeps? You'd think they were watching the house. Watching, spying, might be following us, muttered Uncle Vernon wildly. But what should we do, Vernon? Should we write back? Tell him we won't we don't want Harry could see Uncle Vernon's shiny black shoes pacing up and down the kitchen. No, he said finally. No. We'll ignore it. If they don't get an answer, yes, that's best. We won't do anything at all. But I'm, I'm not having one of those in the house, Petunia. Didn't we swear when we took him in we'd stamp out that dangerous nonsense? That evening when he got back from work, Uncle Vernon did something he'd never he'd never done before. He visited Harry in his cupboard. Where's my letter? said Harry. The moment Uncle Vernon had squeezed through the door, who's writing to me? No one. It was addressed to you by a mistake, said Uncle Vernon shortly. I have burned it. It was not a mistake, said Harry angrily. It's my cu it has my cupboard on it. Silence, yelled Uncle Vernon, and a couple of spiders fell from the ceiling. He took a few deep breaths and then forced him his face into a smile which looked quite painful. Um, yes, Harry, about the cupboard. You're on an... Your aunt and I have been thinking. You're really getting a bit big for it. We think it might be nice if you moved into D Dudley's second bedroom. Why, said Harry. Don't ask questions, snapped his uncle. Take the stuff upstairs now. There, see, there's a picture of Vernon with Dudley and Harry. The Dursley's house had four bedrooms. One for Aunt one for Aunt Petunia and Uncle Vernon, one for visitors, usually Uncle Vernon's sister Marge, one where Dudley slept and one where Dudley kept all the toys and things that didn't fit in his first bedroom. It only took Harry one trip upstairs to move everything he owned from the cupboard to this room. He sat down on the bed and stared around. Nearly everything in here was broken. The month-old camera was lying on top of a small working tank Harry Dudley had once driven for driven over the next door's dog huh a month old camera was laying on top of a small working tank oh tank okay Dudley had once driven over the next door's dog in the corner was Dudley's first ever television set, which he put his foot through when his favorite program had been canceled. There was a large bird cage, which had once held a parrot that Dudley had swapped at school for a real air rifle, which is now on the top shelf with the end all bent because Dudley had sat on it. Other shelves were full of books. These were the only things in the room that looked as though they'd never been touched. From downstairs came the sounds of Dudley bawling at his mother. I don't want him in there. I need that room. Make him get out. Harry sighed and stretched out on the bed. Yesterday he'd given anything to be up here. Today he'd rather be back in his cupboard with that letter than up here without it. Next morning at breakfast everyone was rather quiet. Dudley was in shock. 
He screamed, whacked his father with his smelting stick, been sick on purpose, kicked his mother and thrown his tortoise through the greenhouse roof, and he still didn't have his room back. Harry was thinking about this time yesterday and bitterly wishing he'd opened the letter in the hall. Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia kept looking at each other darkly. When the post arrived, Uncle Vernon, who seemed to be trying to be nice to Harry, made Dudley go and get it. They heard him banging things with his smelting stick all the way down the hall. Then he shouted, There's another one! Mr. H. Potter, the smallest bedroom for private drive. With a strangled cry, Uncle Vernon leapt from his seat and ran down the hall, Harry right behind him. Uncle Vernon had to wrestle Dudley to the ground to get the letter from him, which was made difficult by the fact that Harry had grabbed Uncle Vernon around the neck from behind. After, after a minute of confused fighting in which everyone got hit a lot by the smelting stick, Uncle Vernon straightened up, grasping for, gasping for breath with Harry's letter clutched in his hand. Go to your cupboard, I mean your bedroom, he wheezed at Harry Dudley. Go, just go. Harry walked around and around his new room. Someone knew he'd moved out of his cupboard and they seemed to know he hadn't received his first letter. Surely that they, that meant they'd try again, and this time he'd make sure they didn't fail. He had a plan. The repaired alarm clock rang at 6 o'clock the next morning. Harry turned it off quickly and dressed silently. He mustn't wake the Dursleys. He stole downstairs without turning on any of the lights. He was going to wait for the postman on the corner of Privet Drive and get the letters from, for number four first. His heart hammered as he crept across the dark hall towards the front door. Ah! Harry leapt into the air. He trotted on something big and squashy on the doormat. Something alive. Lights clicked on upstairs, and to his horror, Harry realized that the big squashy something <laughs> had been his uncle's face. Uncle Vernon had been lying at the foot of the front door in a sleeping bag, clearly making sure that Harry didn't do exactly what he'd been trying to do. He shouted at Harry for about half an hour and then told him to go and make a cup of tea. Harry shuffled miserably off into the kitchen, and by the time he got back, the post had arrived right into Uncle Vernon's lap. Harry had seen three letters addressed in green ink. I want, he began, but Uncle Vernon was tearing the letters into pieces before his eyes. <clears throat> Uncle Vernon didn't go to work that day. He stayed at home and nailed up the letter box. See, he explained to Aunt Petunia through a mouth full of nails. If they can't deliver them, they'll just go give up. I'm not sure that's how it works, Vernon. Oh, these people's mind, minds work in strange ways, Petunia. They're not like you and me, said Uncle Vernon, trying to knock in a nail with a piece of <laughs> with a piece of fruit cake Aunt Petunia had just brought him. On Friday, no fewer than twelve letters arrived for Harry. As I couldn't go through the letter box, I had been pushed under the door, sl slot through the sides, and a few even forced through the small window in the downstairs toilet. Uncle Vernon stayed at home again. After burning all the letters, he got out a hammer and nail and poured it up the cracks around the front and back doors so no one could go out. He, he hummed tip toe through the tulips as he worked and jumped at small noises. On Saturday, things began to get out of hand. Twenty-four letters to Harry found their way into the house, rolled up and hidden inside each of the two dozen eggs that the very confused milkman had handed Aunt Petunia through the living room window. While well, Uncle Vernon made furious phone calls to the post office and the dairy trying to find someone to complain to, Aunt Bettina shredded the letters in her food mixer. Who on earth wants to talk to you this badly? said Dudley in a, to Harry in amazement. On Sunday morning, Uncle Vernon sat down at the breakfast table looking tired and rather ill, but happy. 
No post on Sundays. He reminded them happily as they spread marmalade on his knees <laughs> on his newspapers. No damn letters today. Fun funnily enough, so earlier I was talking to Jordan about a package we got yesterday, and instead of saying mail, I was like I. I was talk. I said to Jordan that I was talking to a nurse, and I said there there shouldn't be any post yesterday. And Jordan was like, "Normal people call it mail," and I'm like, "I'm sorry, I had a Harry Potter no, moment." I said we're American. We oh yeah. Mail, we call it mail in America. And I was just like, "Sorry, I had a Harry Potter moment." No post on Sundays. Yeah, Paul. <laughs> take out of Syria. They're jerks. Something came whizzing down. The kitchen chimney as he spoke and caught him sharply on the back of the head. Next moment, 30 or 40 letters came pelting out of the fireplace like bullets. The Dursley stuck, but Harry leapt into the air trying to catch one. Out! Out! Uncle Vernon seized Harry around the waist and threw him into the hall. When Aunt Petunia and Dudley... announced you and now you ask me to go to war against the guy I just declared friendship with? And we both just announced you? Yeah, fuck off, Assyria. Sorry, Jordan's yes, playing Yes, England is with me, too. Everyone's like, yeah, they're douchebags. Well, they just took over two city-states, and one of them's right next to my borders, and I'm like, uh-uh, that ain't happening. I'm building up an army. I'm about to go take them out. I'm going to wipe out every city they have. I don't really care. I don't care if you care. <laughs> it's just me talking to myself. And all of YouTube. Well, all of my 69 subscribers. Nice. 69? <laughs> nice. It's hilarious. When <laughs> uh, Aunt Petunia and, bear, shall I love you? and Dudley had, <laughs> had run out with their arms over their faces, Uncle Vernon slammed the door shut. They could hear the letters still streaming into the room, bouncing off the walls and floor. That does it. said Uncle Vernon, trying to speak calmly but pulling a great tufts out of his mustache at the same time. I want you all back here in five minutes, ready to leave. We're going away. Just pack some clothes. No arguments. He looked so dangerous with half his <laughs> mustache missing that no one dared argue. Ten minutes later, they had wrenched their way through the boarded up doors and were in the car speeding towards the motorway. Dudley was sniffing and sniffling in the back seat. His father had hit him around the head for holding them up while he tried to pack his television, video, and computer in his sports bag. They drove. And they drove. Even Aunt Petunia didn't dare ask where they were going. Every now and then Uncle Vernon would take a sharp turning would take a sharp turning and drive in the opposite direction for a while. Shake him off, shake him off, he would mutter whenever he did this. They didn't stop or eat to eat or drink all day. By nightfall, Dudley was howling. He never had such a bad day in his life. He was hungry. He'd missed five television programs he'd wanted to see, and he he's never he'd never gone so long without blowing up an alien on on his computer. Uncle Vernon stopped at last outside a gloomy-looking hotel on the outskirts of a big city. Dudley and Harry shared a room with twin beds and damp, mus musty sheets. Dudley snored, but Harry stayed awake, sitting on the windowsill, staring down at the lights of passing cars and wondering. They ate st stale cornflakes and cold tinned tomatoes on toast for breakfast next day. They had just finished when the owner of the hotel came over to their table. Excuse me, excuse me. But is one of you Mr. H. Potter? I only got about a hundred of these at the front desk. She held up a letter so they could read the green ink address. Mr. H. Potter, room 17, Railview Hotel, Cokeworth. Harry made a grab for the letter, but Uncle Vernon knocked his hand out of the way. The woman stared. I'll take them, said Uncle Vernon, standing up quickly and following her from the dining room. Wouldn't it be better just to go home, dear? Aunt Petunia suggested timidly hours later. But Uncle Vernon didn't seem to hear her. Exactly what he was looking for, none of them knew. 
He drove them into the middle of a forest, got out, looked around, shook his head, got back in the car, and off they were again. The same thing happened in the middle of a plowed field, halfway across the suspension bridge, and at the top of a multi-story car park. Daddy's gone mad, hasn't he? Dudley asked Aunt Petunia dully late that afternoon. Uncle Vernon had parked at the coast looking locked them all inside the car and disappeared. It started to rain. Great drops beat on the roof of the car. Dudley snivelled. It's Monday, he told his mother. The great Humber Humberto. <laughs> huh? Humberto. The great Humberto. On her is on tonight. I want to stay somewhere with a television. Monday. This reminded Harry of something. If it was Monday, and he could usually count on Dudley to know the days of the week because of television, then tomorrow, Tuesday, was Harry's 11th birthday. Of course, his birthdays were never exactly fun. Last year, the Dursleys had given him a coat hanger and a pair of Uncle Vernon's old socks. Still, you weren't 11 every day, only for a year. Uncle Vernon was back, and he was smiling. He was also carrying a long, thin package and didn't answer Aunt Petunia when she asked what he bought. Found the perfect place, he said. Come on, everyone out. It was very cold outside the car. Uncle Vernon was pointing at what looked like a large rock out, way out the way out to sea. Perched on top of the rocks was the most miserable little shack you could imagine. One thing was certain, there was no television in there. Storm forecast for tonight, said Uncle Vernon gleefully clapping his hands together, and this gentleman kindly agreed to lend us his boat. A toothless old man came ambling up to them, pointing in with a rather wicked grin at an old rowing boat bobbing in the iron gray water below them. I've already got us some ring from ra some rations, said Uncle Vernon, so all aboard. It was freezing in the boat. Icy sea spray and rain crept down their necks, and a chilly wind whipped their faces. After what seemed like hours, they reached the rock where Uncle Vernon, slipping and sliding, led the way to the broken-down house. Inside was, was horrible. It smelled strongly of seaweed. The wind whistled through the gaps in the wooden walls. And the fireplace was damp and empty. There was only two rooms. See, there's a picture of Uncle Vernon rowing the boat. Uncle Vernon's rations turned out to be a packet of crisps each and four bananas. He tried to start a fire, but the empty crisp packets just smoked and shriveled up. Could do with some of those letters now, eh? He, he said cheerfully. He was in a very good mood. Obviously, he thought nobody stood a chance of reaching them here in a storm to deliver post. Harry privately agreed, though... The thought didn't cheer him up at all. As they fell, the promised storm blew up around them. Spray from the high waves splattered the walls of the hut, and a fierce one rattled the filthy windows. Aunt Patina found a few moldy blankets in the second room and made up a bed for Dudley on the moth-eaten sofa. She and Uncle Vernon went off to the lumpy bed next door and Harry was left to find the softest bit of floor he could and to curl up under the thinnest, most ra ragged blanket. The storm raged more and more furiously as the night went on. Harry couldn't sleep. He shivered and turned over, trying to get comfortable, his stomach rumbling with hunger. Deadly snores were drowned by the low rolls of thunder that started near midnight. The lighted dials of Dudley's watch, which was dangling over the edge of the sofa on his fat wrist, told Harry he'd been eleven in ten minutes' time. He lay and watched his birthday tick clo closer, wondering if the Dursleys would remember at all, wondering where the letter writer was now. Five minutes to go. Harry heard something creak outside. He hoped the roof wasn't going to fall in. 
although he might be warmer if it did. Four minutes to go. Maybe the house in Privet Drive would be so full of letters when they got back that he'd be able to steal one somehow. Three minutes to go. Was that the sea slapping hard on the rock like that? And two minutes ago, what was that funny crunching noise? Was the rock crumbling into the sea? One minute to go and he'd be eleven. Thirty seconds, twenty, ten, nine. Maybe he'd wake Dudley up just to annoy him. Three, two, one, boom! The whole shack shivered and Harry sat bolt upright, staring at the door. Someone was outside, knocking to come in. And we will wait to read the next chapter. Hope you guys enjoy it. enjoyed that. Um, let me know what you think. And I hope you all have a great night. Bye.